to the Loins of History, a podcast connecting the past to the present and improving historical and political literacy. I'm your host, Colin, and I'm joined by my co-host, Jay. And today, we're going to continue our series on the fall of the French Third Republic. Jay, do we have any shout outs this week that we want to give to our, our new subscribers before we get started? Yeah, want to give a shout out to Dennis Walton, our new subscriber on YouTube. Dennis, thanks for thanks for subscribing and for the rest of our listeners, if if you subscribe to us on YouTube or if you're listening to us on Spotify or Apple, if you give us a five-star review and comment so that we can see your name or even just comment on the YouTube video, we'll give you a shout out at the beginning of our next episode. We love getting new listeners and and yeah, Dennis Thanks for subscribing, man. All right. And with that, this is our third episode in the fall of France. We're taking a little bit of a different approach from other episodes in our fall of civilization series, only because the fall of France is uh, such an interesting topic to me that it's worth breaking down in detail. And this episode is going to be our first episode where we really talk about only a period of about two, two and a half years in France. So we're going to talk about the context of the remilitarization of the Rhineland in 1936, March to be exact. And I'm going to assume that most of our listeners have at least heard about the remilitarization of the Rhineland. If you're a millennial male or even Gen X maybe, and you've played some World War II video game, usually starts with the remilitarization of the Rhineland. That was kind of seen as the as the no turning back point in in World War II. So assuming that most of y'all have heard about the real the remilitarization of the Rhineland, I'm gonna assume though that like, because this was true for me. Like I have a degree in history did not know the details. I've done a lot of research and reading on World War II. Um, one of my research interests is actually in the Pacific Theater. So my, I don't know how to describe it. Like it's World War II, but I have done a lot of World War II reading over the course of my career. And I didn't know a lot of these details. So I'm going to assume that, that y'all have heard about the remilitarization of the Rhineland, but I hope to give y'all something new and really talk about the decisions that France was making for the year, year and a half leading up to Hitler's decision and how that played into what felt like an inevitable collapse in 1940. And we're going to talk about how it applies to us today. And we're going to talk about uh, what the French could have done differently. Okay, so point number one, wanted to give some background into why the demilitarization, why was why was the Rhineland demilitarized in the first place? Was it just kind of like this punitive measure? It was actually much more than that. And at, in the Treaty of Versailles at the end of World War One, the whole framework was we have to prevent another great war. So yes, there were reparations, which by the way, Germany like basically never paid any of their reparations. Um, and the whole like the whole purpose of the treaty was to completely neuter Germany's ability to start another war to be aggressive. And they in the in the Allied powers, Ger- or Great Britain, France, the United States, Russia, really thought that by doing that, well, that will prevent a war. If the people who started the war can't start another war, then there won't be any war. Uh, And what they didn't really think about and what they didn't really consider uh, in the Treaty of Versailles was, okay, we've done all these actions in 1918, 1919, and so on to to neuter Germany, but what are we going to do 20 years from now? Are they are they going to start a war then? And they really they really didn't think those things through. So France in the treaty insisted that the entirety of this area known as the Rhineland, which is effectively the area in between Alsace Lorraine, which was controlled by Germany in between 1870 to 1914 ish, well 1918 I guess. Uh, but it had been given back to France in the treaty. So it was this area between Alsace-Lorraine and the Rhine. The most significant part of this area 
was known as the SAR, S-A-A-R. The SAR had the highest contra- concentration of German industry in the entire country. So if you think like here in the United States, you know, especially early 20th century, like steel mills in Pennsylvania uh, was a huge thing. Coal mining in Western Virginia, gold and silver in Nevada and California, like industrial sectors were geographically focused in a way that like it's still true today like silicon valley for example is like the it focus it would actually silicon valley is a great example it would be like the united states losing a war and uh, you know whoever japan i'm thinking the man in the high castle here japan was like hey we're going to have troops in san francisco and you guys can't put any troops in Silicon Valley. Now, the point is in the event that Germany were to break the treaty, were to be aggressive or something like that, it would be incumbent upon the French or the Japanese <laughs> in my hypothetical example here to be able to essentially like rapidly move into that area and take that economically valuable location and kind of hold it hostage. The, so the, the the demilitarization meant that they couldn't garrison troops and they were not allowed to build fortifications. That's that's all it meant. It wasn't a no man's zone. There were plenty of civilians there. The the industry during times of peace was completely allowed to operate as usual. They just couldn't defend it, and that's and that's why the de, the demilitarization was so significant. You know, kind of given, kind of beginning with the end in mind here. Um, if France allowed Germany to remilitarize the Rhineland, especially this area, the Saar, essentially Germany could like build fortifications opposite the Maginot Line, and they then could prevent France from taking any punitive offensive actions towards Germany in the event that maybe Germany say they got aggressive with Czechoslovakia or with Poland. Or with the Russians, even. Uh, spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. <laughs> France could effectively do nothing. But with the demilitarized Rhineland, France, you know, had Germany by their manhood. <laughs> and Germany really do anything about it. They couldn't defend. They were very much open to attack. That's why the remilitarization of the Rhineland is significant. So... All right, so this is this is the story of how the Ryan land got remilitarized. And it's honestly just kind of one of the more facepaw moments in French history because it's like, you know, again, bottom line up front here, France had ample opportunity to enforce the treaty and they literally did nothing. So the question we have to ask ourselves is like why? Like what what was going on with French decision makers? Uh, to you know what was going on within France to to lead to this just like obvious face paw moment. So first point here is that the French actually got notifications that Hitler in Germany was planning on remilitarizing the Rhineland as early as October of 1934. They had a consul general in Cologne, which Cologne is in the Rhineland, that the, the German government was planning on sending troops back in. You know, Hitler came to power as chancellor in 1933. So this is, I think, slightly more than a year after Hitler came to power. And that was immediately one of the first things that he wanted to do uh, after, you know, he was already building up the Luftwaffe. The Reichswehr was already, you know, beginning its clandestine rearmament. And the Rhineland was like, Hitler knew that they needed to remilitarize. Uh, when that consul general started sending reports back to the French foreign ministry, they basically did nothing. Uh, and it was and it was very obvious that the tone, the mood within the French government this entire time would be one of just fear. It was strange because th- the fear was not because Germany had this massive military like and we'll see, like German's military was still pretty puny all the way up into March of 36 and and beyond, to be honest. But there was just this like debilitating fear 
that had taken hold of the French government. And that when, kind of like when you hear news that you really don't want to hear, your first initial reaction is denial. And that is exactly, exactly what happened. So there was this guy, the French foreign minister at that time was a dude named Pierre Etienne Flandon. Uh, and he he's an interesting fellow, won't go into too much detail, but he plays a large role in at first kind of ignoring, but then being one of the kind of voices in the wilderness, once it was blatantly obvious, just crying out, going like, can we do something? The other The other main guy that's worth talking about and how this all plays out is the, uh, you could think of him as the senior military officer in the French military, a guy named Maurice Gamelon. And Gamelon gets basically, you know, the historical credit <laughs> for being a coward and not, you know, not leading the French military to take the steps that it needed to take to to counter Germany. Which that's kind of ironic. He was labeled a coward. Was Gamelon in World War One? Wasn't he like one of France's greatest heroes? Didn't he have a heroic and that's why he was put in such a high regard and such a high position. Yes. It's not that he was a hero because I don't think he had like any combat, you know, he didn't wow anyone in combat. Rather, he was Joffrey's assistant. Uh, so Joffrey was a hero in that he was, he held the position of the senior military guy in the French, in the French army in August of 1914. And I'm pretty sure he retained that post for at least a year, if not two. Uh, and Joffrey's an interesting and fascinating guy to study, but he's very much credited for stopping the initial German invasion and like just the initial defense. He was he was later he was later fired and I forget who took over from him. I don't know if it was Foch or not, but anyway. Yeah, he's the guy that's credited with stopping the initial German invasion. Gamblon was like his either his chief of staff or like aide de camp or something like that. So Gamblon like came to power because he was connected. He came in on Joffrey's coattails, more or less. Yeah, and I'm sure he played a significant role in World War One, but like I don't I did not get the impression that he was a hero. Well, you know, I did notice one I did notice one thing about that. He had been in for 49 years by the time uh, excuse me, 45 years by 1935. So he began his military service in 1891. So he was a very old man, really, by the time, you know, this started. So you're asking like, be like asking your grandfather to go get in a street fight. Yeah, no, that's that's funny. I just watched a Jackie Chan movie and I'm pretty sure that grandpa could protect me pretty good. <laughs> or at least that's what he looks like in the movies. Sorry, that was random. Yeah, so Gamla and Flandon uh, are... Two main two main characters in this story here. So Flandall was getting these reports since the end of 34. And in 35 is when he started to take it seriously. So like months after the fact, the one guy, the rest of the French government was doing nothing. Yeah, so Flandall began becoming concerned. Well, like any good foreign minister, his job is to, you know, be the guy who talks to other governments. So what did Flandau do? He, in 1935, decided to go talk to the Brits. And this is very much the Brits and the French had another detente. Like they, um, you know, were still very friendly. They had kind of a de facto alliance, if not an official alliance at this point. And he went to go talk to the Brits. Uh, and this is during the Eden government. So yeah, Eden's out, I think pre-Stanley Baldwin. Uh, Stanley Baldwin, but anyway, Eden was in was in charge. Anthony Eden, and he went and talked to him. The Brits kind of started doing what they would do really up until September of 1939, and that is they wanted to maintain a position of ambiguity because in the British government they de also desperately did not want another great war. Like it seemed like the Allies in general, but kind of led by the Brits. Uh, was all actions were to avoid war at all costs. Later, when we do our episode on the Munich conference and what happened to Czechoslovakia, they were explicitly saying avoid war at all costs. And I think one of the lessons learned to take away 
from the series and you know these episodes now is how do you actually prevent conflict? Do you prevent conflict through appeasement or do you convict prevent conflict by ensuring your adversary knows that you can freaking wipe the floor with them? <laughs> and I tend to believe it's the latter is what actually prevents conflict, not appeasement. Speak softly and carry a big stick. It was pretty effective. If your adversary knows you're not going to do anything, like they're going to be more aggressive. Like good people, good countries, and I would consider the America and the West to be good countries. Sure, we're not perfect. We are representative democracies at a minimum, which makes us better than non-representative <laughs> democracies. You know, at these times, at this time, we were dealing. With, you know, Hitler was a dictator. Mussolini was a dictator. And those good countries have to be willing to, what is the, this is a take on a quote, but like have to be willing to commit acts of violence uh, on behalf of its citizen. Like it is, you need, uh, I love how, so random thoughts right now, T.R. Fehrenbach's this kind of war. He's talking about Korea and the Korean war, but he talks about how America needs to be willing to send in its legions so that it can main, maintain peace on the frontier or sorry, peace at home. And it's this Roman concept of like the legions go fight on the frontier so that we don't have to fight in Rome. Anyway. Yeah. Appeasement doesn't work folks. Okay. So Flandon went to London and he got a lot of him and Han from the Brits. And it was because the Brits basically, they didn't want to encourage the French. They didn't want to encourage the French to do something aggressive that might be seen by Hitler as aggressive. And therefore, Hitler started another war. And we're already getting the warnings. It's almost like it's, you know, it's almost like you're dealing with such a narcissist in Hitler that everyone walks on eggshells around him in order to please him. When in fact, it's like, Hitler's the problem, folks. <laughs> like the rest of us normal, sane people, we're all walking on eggshells so that we can try to keep the peace when in fact we all need to realize Hitler's the one that's not that's not keeping the peace. Hitler's the guy. It's his fault, not ours. And Flandon gets allotted just no response, him and Han from the Brits. So he goes back to he comes back to Paris. And he immediately requests to convene what's called the Supreme Military Committee, of which Gamelon and the Minister of Defense, which is a, is a, a different guy whose name escapes me right now. Oh, General Marin, Morin. I don't know how to pronounce his name. M A U R I M Morin. He's the Minister of Defense. So, like the Secretary of Defense in ish French French government. He meets with them, and General Morin. Uh, responds with, hey, he, or sorry, Flandon poses, Flandon poses a question. He says, what can the French army do if Germany remilitarizes the Rhineland? And the military, the French military's response was, the French military is organized as a purely defensive force. It, the match was set at that point. And we will see from this point all the way to immediately after Germany moving into the Rhineland, you know, we talked about in our last episode after World War One, the French military's brain evaporated, <laughs> and they th they believed the defense would save them, and everything like the entire country was just basically ready to go fight trench warfare all over again in its next conflict, and an idea of taking offensive action into the Rhineland, the French military resisted that at every turn despite its civilian leadership basically saying like hey we think we want you guys to uh, enforce the treaty and they were like that would be really hard and that like that was general general gumlon's like repeated thing over and over again was he would say we can only move into the rhineland if we completely mobilize the entire country like call up all the reservists turn over like industry to the military, like start dictating you're going to build ammunition and not, you know, whatever it is that you otherwise build, that kind of thing. You're going to build tanks and not cars. You're going to build planes and not, you know, other things, etc. He was like, we have to completely mobilize. That's the only way that we can move into the SAR, even though the French standing army was like some 70 divisions at this point. 
they had a very large stand. They had the largest standing army in Europe. And yeah, Gamelon took a it's all or nothing approach. And it's kind of obvious that the reason why he did that was he was just trying to avoid conflict. Again, prevent avoid war at all costs. Not prevent war, avoid war at all costs. All right, so Colin, go ahead. You look like you're about to say something. Bear with me here. If you've ever, and this is going to seem unrelated to history, but you'll get it as when I get to the end of it. If you've ever taken uh, like Lean Six Sigma classes or like to, to that certification about process, uh, you might have come across this this story. So I think it was Saturn. They, you know, obviously they used to make cars. You don't really see them on the road anymore. There was an, and I think it was Saturn. I could be wrong. Feel free to fact check me, but I do know it was an automobile bake. In this course, I remember the instructor talking through that they had one specific part and they were like, their engineers came back and said, hey, if we fix it now, we can fix it for like three cents per part. And Saturn said, no. Fast forward. And they made it to another step in the process of assembling and they said, hey, there's still a problem. I don't remember which part it was, but then they're like, it'll be 10 cents if we fix it now. Saturn said, no. Fast forward another time. They're like, hey, this is not good. And this could be really bad. If we stop, we can fix it now for 50 cents. Nope. They got all the way to the end. And they're like, hey, at this point now, we can fix it still. But it's going right. to be like a dollar a part. A which, huge cost. Millions yeah. of parts. So it's, it's, we're talking millions of dollars. Huge cost. They didn't. What ended up happening mm. was a lot of people ended up dying driving Saturns yeah. because their cars were unsafe and they were causing accidents. I want to say it was pretty huh. catastrophic what happened. A lot of people yeah. died. The company bankrupted because of it. Because the settlements and the lawsuits yeah. and the fallout was billions of dollars. Perfect. Now let's relate that yeah. to the French. In 1934, Hitler's army was, mm. I think it was uh, a book called Blitzkrieg that I was reading about the German army. And in 1934, yeah. they were basically just like testing out these theories. They had armored vehicles that were covered in cloth and plywood boards because they didn't have enough material or the manufacturing capacity to put them all you know, in steel oh, yeah. and metal. So it was basically all a facade. All the French had to do yeah. with 70 divisions was march in and say, hey, you're not going to do that. Knock it off. We're going to depose you. We're, Hey, we're, you know what? We need to enforce this treaty. In 1934, they, in 1936, even then, they still had units. Um, you know, they still had units with these basically makeshift armored vehicles. And I say makeshift armored vehicles because mm -hmm. one of the things we know the Germans oh, yeah. so well for in World War II was yeah. like Panzers and how like invincible they were. But ten years before, yeah. they were cloth and wood basically. Fast, you know. So when they invade in 1936. Could have stopped them then. Cost would have been a little higher because they were a little better. They were they were really starting to to materialize their military. They were starting to yeah. their doctrine was becoming more sound. Could have done it then. Didn't do it. Could have done it in thirty eight, but they didn't. And at this point, by the time they invaded France, the Germans had oh, yeah. such a they truly had a war machine at that point, and they were overwhelmed. They had perfected like it's interesting. You look at like anybody's in the military, the U S military, like you look at our doctrine of like close air support, deep air support, integration mm -hmm. of fires. Oh, like yeah. that was the Germans in world war two. They perfected it. Um, I think it was Guderian was like, Hey, no, like we're going to build yep. the German army around tanks and everything else is going to support the tanks. We're going to have our, our artillery fire. We're going to coordinate with air fire. Our infantry are going to be there because we're going to avoid trench warfare. And we're going to set up, supply mm -hmm. lines and everything is going to move so fast and it's going to be so coordinated that you're not going to know what 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 happened to you and they had years mm -hmm. to perfect it and the french did nothing sitting there hoping to avoid war hoping that yeah. hey maybe he'll this guy will just stop maybe maybe he'll stop but he never did and the cost was france being completely overthrown and world war ii breaking out love that saturn example because you're right it is there's got to be a, a term, but your costs just exponentially go up the longer you continue to put your head in the sand. Um, any any project manager, and this this is you know any project manager knows like the further you go on a project, yeah. any course correction is going to cost more time and money. Like anybody that's in like software development. Any, anything out there. Further you are along, the more it's going to cost, the longer it's going to take to fix it, the, the greater the effort's going to be. 
you know, it was probably obvious in that Saturn th- example that they were like, hey, we need to fix this. Like, this has got to get fixed at some point. As opposed to like, we don't really know. This could be a non-issue. Like, if it's a little more blurry, like that's a different situation. But in this situation, it was, you know, in the, you know, the Rhineland situation, it's like they knew it was happening. Like Hitler, Hitler advertised his intentions all the time with his speeches. Like no one was shocked. Like Hitler had no surprise whatsoever. It was so funny. The, there may have been tactical surprise at a given point, but there was no strategic surprise. Like everyone knew what Hitler was planning for a long time. So yeah, it, it's definitely one of the more tragic points when – oh, so to your point, you know, fast forward to when they actually moved in. When the Germans remilitarized the Rhineland, they only sent three battalions in, three battalions of infantry. That's it. Uh, and for those of y'all that maybe aren't as equated with the military, like, that's nothing. <laughs> like, there are – there's probably, you know, depending on the organization at the time, but roughly there's like a dozen battalions in a division. Uh, like combat battalions, not to include support battalions, a dozen battalions in a division. And like France had 70, 70 divisions. Uh, so we're talking like hundreds upon hundreds of battalions in Germany, put three into the Rhineland. We'll talk about from towards the end of the episode of what the Germans thought would happen. But you talk about like, it wouldn't have even come down to actual military action. Like the French government just had to communicate to the Germans, hey guys, we hear that you guys are planning to remilitarize the Rhineland. Hey, just so you know, that's a violation of the Treaty of Versailles. And we absolutely will like invade the Rhineland. Like we will, we will, you know, move, move in to counter your remilitarization. Like just in case you're wondering, I'm already going to tell you what we're going to do. Like that that could have prevented World War II. Like as crazy as that's uh, as that is, but like you know, we you go back to the phony war in you know from thirty nine into forty. The phony the phony war period is the is the time from you know late nineteen thirty nine, but to the summer of forty, um, it, where there wasn't really a whole lot of. There was war, but there wasn't really a whole lot of combat operations. And the reason why that period even existed was because France couldn't do anything. The Germans had built what they called the Siegfried Line, uh, counter opposite the Maginot Line. Like France could do nothing. And the French Air Force was nothing compared to the Luftwaffe. And, you know, they had they had six months so while while Germany overran Poland. They overran, you know, Czechoslovakia in a sense, like... They completely pulled Romania and Hungary into their orbit, the Italians in their orbit, in Yugoslavia, and like France could do nothing. So if France could have done something, i.e. go back in the Rhineland quickly, like that could that could have changed the entire course of World War II for sure. By the way, it was technically GM that got sued and it was called Switchgate. Uh, they... It was occurring mm. in Saturn cars, but GM owned them, so they got sued, and it was nine hundred million dollars. I, that's I wasn't certain, but I remember Saturn went away during the financial crisis in two thousand. Yeah, nine hundred like, million dollars in like post Great Recession is money GM did not have. Yeah, yeah. Well, so thank you, anyway. tax, American taxpayers. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you bailed them out you, anyway. You, you, whether you like it or knew it or not. You paid the consequence for Saturn's failures. So there you go. And just like Gamwan's failures, the French people paid the consequences for that as well. So one one question, Colin, that I wanted to ask you before we kind of move on, you know, and I, and I painted, I talked about like, there's this theme of the, the civilian leaders in the French government were kind of like, hey, military, what can you do about this? Hey, military, like, are you going to do anything about this? Hey, like they were kind of poking and prodding. And Gimla and the the French military were like, eh, we're defensive. It's going to take a lot. Like we could do it. Man, we just really got a lot of stuff going on, you know? Like that is different than what is currently the, the, stat, the status in the American military. Because the civilian authorities have a much tighter control 
over the military. So much so that I think the recent withdrawal in Afghanistan is a great case in point. I think we've known that the military for years, regardless of who was in office, was saying, hey, we really shouldn't pull off Afghanistan. Like The reason why we stayed in for so long was because the military guys were saying, the generals were the ones saying, and admirals, it's going to be bad if we pull out of there. But the you know it was the Trump administration directed withdrawal. It was actually the Obama administration before that. The Trump administration was direct, directed a withdrawal, but then kind of put it off. And then the Biden administration was like, "Enough is enough. We're going to withdraw," and all hell broke loose. Right. And I guess what I'm trying to say is, regardless, this isn't a partisan comment. This is just the way the the federal government is organized and kind of the culture between civilian culture of civilian control of the military and. United States. Civilians tell the military what to do. And the culture with it for the generals is very much like Roger. Like they'll they'll push back and blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, they will do what the civilians tell them to do. But we see something different here. And we kind of see, you know, as we talked about in the the Dreyfus affair, the French military had this prestige and was such a cornerstone of French society that there wasn't this direct as much civilian control of the military. The minister of, of war was a general as opposed to a civilian. So I guess, Colin, my, my question for you is like, which is like, is one better than the other? Uh, is France's like, hey, the military can kind of do what they want. Is that a good thing? Did it like, was it, was their system bad or was it just the people in the system that was bad? Like, what are, what are your thoughts there? B, all of the above. <laughs> I think humanity has a tendency to drive on opposite shoulders of the road, vice mm. right down the middle. So the French had all of the opportunities and plenty of people in positions of authority to make the decisions that they needed. So you can't really say it's like a system issue because it came down to like a moral or intellectual failure on their part you know whether it was their fear it, misunderstanding they had people in positions that could have made a difference to stop it and then you you know you bring up like the US and civilian control like i don't think it's necessarily better to have civilians calling the shots but it is important to have civilians holding leaders accountable um, where they can say very quickly say okay you know like if the Secretary of Defense has a very bad policy and ends up that policy gets a lot of Americans killed or puts us in a very bad situation, Americans have a means to get rid of that person kind of indirectly by mm. voting out the president or you know then they replace them or just political pressure in general to have their elected officials get rid of them. So that's kind of what you want. Um, now, that's great in theory, right? So like in theory, that, that works great. It's like, oh, representative people are logical individuals and they'll think through things. And if somebody doesn't do their job, they'll just remove them. It's like, unfortunately, that's just not the reality we live in. So yeah, I kind of look at it as like, it's not like one system is better than the other um, because people are flawed. And like France, it wasn't a process system, you know, issue in France. It was really honestly just kind of a, a moral and mental failure on their part. Mm. The US, though I think the system we have is better, is still subject to the same moral and mental mm. um weakness that mm. France is, right? So like if you have if you have bad generals and bad elected officials, like your not your policy is going to be bad and your actions and then the subsequent consequences are not going to be good. I mean mm. Look at the Arab Spring. Like we thought that was the greatest thing ever at the time. And then it turned out to kind of generally be a disaster. I mean, it destabilized mm. a whole region in the Middle East. Yeah. It was a bad policy decision. We went away from that. Whether you like Donald Trump or not, his idea of like, I'm just going to blow you up on a tarmac. Mm. Um, if you want to do something, I'm not going to start a war, but if you want to do something, I will come at you with the full might of the United States military. Guess yeah. what? People kind of acted a much more civilized and there, there was peace in the Middle East. It was crazy. ISIS just went away. Yeah. ISIS disappeared. They weren't even at the debates. They weren't even brought up. Yeah. And this is not a pro-Trump type of thing. This is a, 
you can have the best intentions executed by people that don't know what they're doing and the consequences can be bad. I think it's a people issue. You yeah. have to have a means to hold people accountable quickly. And if it's not quickly and it's not done by reasonable people, it's not going to be effective and you're just going to get the same results. Dude, I love that answer. <laughs> it was, yeah, I think you're right. The Honestly, I think you somewhat changed my mind because when I was wrote that question, I was thinking like, nah, the way we have it here in the United States is so much better. Even I'm not the, denying it is better, but how but, much better it's, you know. No, yes, yes. That was clear to me. The It's like what really matters here is people are fallible and both systems are subject to weak people. That's and that's such a good way to put it because that's exactly what was going on. Like there's just so much weakness in France at this point that yeah that had more to do with the collapse than the system so let's kind of let's kind of fast forward to beginning of 1936 and by this point so we're at like 3 months prior to the remilitarization at this point again hitler was telegraphing exactly what he's planning on doing like it was not a strategic secret here um there was a lot of international division as to what france should have done for example, the Belgians, who were extremely pacifist at this point, which is crazy because they declared neutrality at the beginning of World War I, uh, and that worked out well for them. <laughs> and they were extremely pacifist, and they communicated to the French, if you guys invade Germany, we consider our defense alliance null and void. And we will not support you in starting World War II. Like they they blamed France because Germany violated the treaty. They were blaming France. So like I wanted to mention that because like just being as fair as possible to France, even at this time, it's like they had other people who were putting a lot of pressure on them to do nothing. You know, Belgium seems like a really small country and it is, but they share a large border, like and a very as World War One and World War Two show, like the the fastest way to Paris is through Belgium, and uh, the best, the biggest defense for Paris is actually what I don't know. Is it Liege? Is that how you pronounce it? There's a big fortress, Liege. Anyway, so it's like this alliance with the Belgians was of the utmost importance to the to the French, and so when you have the Belgians saying like. Hey, we're if you do anything, like we're done, we're out. Like, don't even don't talk to us. Type deal. That's a, that's a big that's a big um, pressure. It, also, that we've mentioned in our last episodes, like internal France divisions were at the boiling over point. Like there were riots in the streets. People were people were dying. A lot of these things we talked about February sixth, which was you know there was attempted coups and you know the communists and the fascists fighting in the streets sometimes together, sometimes against one another. Um, it was just a really bad situation. I just wanted to mention that to say like, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and we could have said like, France should have done something. But it's like, if we were to put ourselves in that shoe, like that's a tough decision. It's a really tough decision to to decide whether or not to go in. So March, March 7th, the day it happened. That morning in Berlin, the French foreign minister a Baron Constantine von Neurath. Uh, he walks in to the French ambassador with this happy and cheerful tone. And he, and he says, hey, great news. We've decided to do a symbolic occupation of the Rhineland. And I give you a series of peace proposals from Hitler himself. Peace. <laughs> and later the French ambassador would basically describe it as a slap in the face. That it's like, wait a minute, you just violated the treaty and you come to me saying, peace, peace. Uh, and it's it's honestly like Hitler's manipulative skills were like second to none. And how like what should have been an event that started World War II, like that's how the treaty's written. The aggressor frames the situation as they're the ones who want peace. Later on, it's very much like spousal abuse. <laughs> and Hitler around noon, so that happened. So the ambassador 
conversation happened around 10 in the morning. Hitler goes on the radio and gives about a two hour long speech around noon. And he, and he ends this speech saying, we pledge that now more than ever, we shall strive for an understanding between European peoples. We have no territorial demands to make in Europe. Germany will never break the peace. It's like, holy moly, like this, this, this manipulation, this, this pop just now popped in my head. The basic principle of camouflage uh, is to, is to, you know, and I'm, when I say camouflage, I mean like color and shape camouflage. Like, you know, maybe there's some, some hunters in our, in our listeners and it's like, okay, you can wear a shirt that has like camo pattern, right? But I'm thinking like a camouflage, like on your face. Like if you're doing cami paint on your face, you can't, like you're not drawing sticks on your face. The basic principle for cami paint on your face is the dark areas of the face. So like your eyes underneath your nose, like the sides of your nose, your neck, the dark areas, you try to make light. You put light, bright colors. In the light, the light parts of your face, your brow, your nose, your cheek, your chin, you put dark colors. And the whole point is just to like the human eye recognizes shapes and it recognizes colors before it recognizes like other finer details. So it's like you just try to do the opposite of what you're actually doing and that obfuscates what you actually are. And that is literally what Hitler was doing at this point is like, he's literally breaking the treaty. And this is not the first time. And he comes by saying like, we have no more territorial demands. Like we'll never break the peace. And it's like hindsight being 2020. We're all like, yeah, we know that's BS. (laughs) So what was the French? So let's look at what the French response to, to all this was. First of all, we see delay, right? We see they didn't even have a cabinet meeting until the next day. All those, all those dudes, which Flandon or Flandon was in his forties. I think he was actually the youngest foreign minister ever in French history at this point. He was like in his mid forties. So he's the young guy in this entire situation. All these dudes just like go to bed. Like, Hey, it's late. I'm tired. I'm going to like drink my wine. Which is crazy. It's crazy to me. It's wild. Yeah. Like you literally just had your doom begin the process of ending your country and France went to bed, which is wild. Anyway, so the next day, (laughs) that morning, the French cabinet finally gets together and has a meeting and everyone's super nervous. Again, just this atmosphere of fear and dread hung over the heads of everyone in this room. Um, And, you know, there were a lot of meetings, there were a lot of discussion and everything kind of came down to this cabinet meeting. And the General Maron, the minister of war, kind of started the meeting and he said, the foreign minister, Flandon, talks of entering the Rhineland. There are risks to this. And someone, unknown, says, do the risks entail war? Nobody responds silence almost like this like the word war was like this oh, like since shivers down their spine type deal no one responds moron continues the present state of the french army does not allow us to run risks in flandon who after talking to all the people you know i kind of mentioned at the beginning of the episode he at first he was kind of also afraid but then he kind of realized like we got to do something here uh, Flandon looked to the president at at this time, and he just says, "I see, Mister President, there is no use insisting." And that's it. That was the cabinet meeting. Like it was very much like no one wanted to say the dirty word. No one wanted to talk details. It was just kind of like it's risky. Let's not do anything. And that was it. Like I'm sorry. Like that's literally the definition of cowardice <laughs> for. Like you have the fate of millions of French people in your hands. You have, like I said, your doom is making moves and they're just like, eh, it's too risky. Let's not do anything. It came down to really, at the end of the day, cowardice. It wasn't a process thing. It was, yeah. we're just not going to do anything. Yeah. Which honestly, I think one of the takeaways here is like, 
weak leadership is not merely a talking point. Like strong leadership actually matters in moments of crisis, in like intense things. And to be honest, like the French people were not privy to the inner workings of this meeting. Like there was no internet, there was no CNN, you know, Fox News type deal. It was like they had the radio and they only got the information when, you know, the politicians decided to go on the radio and they had the newspapers. As we talked about before, like the newspapers were ridiculously biased, very tabloid esque, like not reliable sources of information at all. And it was just like weakness. Like the American people should absolutely look to strength in their leaders. And, you know, before anyone draw conclusions that I'm not trying to say here, is that like strength, like strength is comprehensive. It's not like, oh, I'm an angry dude, right? It's it's like strength of character, strength of will. Like, okay, when the hard decisions need to be made, I'm going to make the hard decision. And I'm going to do what's think, right. Go ahead. I think strength goes beyond just military might. Yes. Like you can have a great military, but if your economy is in shambles, if your country is – culturally, politically, you know, all of these things in shambles, if your education, there's things you can do to project strength of will and character and all of these things that will formulate a strong nation of which a strong military will flow out of. It's not just simply going around shooting guns and dropping bombs in places. I do think that's part of it. Sometimes those those tough decisions and you have to do that. But strength is not like the French. There's there's probably even more ways to defeat Hitler going back into the early 30s and 20s even in Germany. There's ways that France could have built themselves up beyond just their military because they had 70 divisions. So it wasn't a numbers game. You know, had they had a stronger national will or national identity, stronger economy where people weren't. There, you didn't have communists and fascists fighting within, you know, different sects of its own government. They yeah. might, the, the French Third Republic might have been able to put up stronger resistance even after they got invaded. Let's say they had made up, made military mistakes, but they had all these other things to unite them and create a strong republic. Yeah. They might have been able to resist longer um, or dominated and prevented Germany from rising at, at all. I think you're right. I actually wanted to read two quotes. The first one's short and the second one's kind of longer. To really that really just kind of paints the picture for the weak and miserable state of the leaders in France. The first one is a later recollection from the prime minister of France at this time. His name's Albert Surratt. He I said this in earlier episodes, I should say it again. My source for all of this information is William Schur's the the collapse of the Third Republic. Uh, and in this book, he just he did such a good job talking directly to these people. And so, like both of these quotes are individuals who spoke directly to sure. Uh so Surat later recalled, uh, why did the chief of our arm uh, why did the chief of our armies, Gemlon, not grit his teeth and pound on the table and in the presence of the government hammer out a ringing profession of his faith? Why, instead of multiplying the objections in order to discourage action, did he not cry out to his listeners, we must march. It is our duty. We will win. There's nothing else to do. And I think what Surat's getting at here is like, where's the conviction? You know, like, where is the, like, this is France. Like, these Germans, their military is almost non-existent. Like, who are we? I think I think in our very first episode, Clemenceau has a great quote that, that Schur brings out, where Clemenceau said decades before, he says, where is France? What became of the French? And it's like, are these the... Are these not the same people who formed Napoleon's Grand Armée? Are these not the same people that like burned Moscow, like that conquered all of Europe? Like, is this not the same country that has been the dominating force on continental Europe for almost like like eight hundred years? Uh, like, what? 
<laughs> He's like, you're you know, the chief of the army, dude. If you, if you want to contrast it to Rome, if you know about like the Punic Wars, during the Second Punic War, Hannibal was just ravaging Italy. And mm. he beat the snot out of the Romans again and again and again. Like I think at Cannae, they lost like sixty to 80,000 Romans just in one battle. I mean, it was just a slaughter. You know what the Romans did? They're like, all right, let's go get another army. Let's keep let's fighting. Let's do it again. It was years that Hannibal was just marching up and down Italy, just like burning it and defeating armies nonstop. Right. And the Romans never – he never took Rome. They never capitulated and the Romans won the Second Punic War. Punic War. And then right. years later, Carthago delenda est. They were like, Carthage must be destroyed. And then they salted yeah. the earth. Like if you were to compare a national – like strength, national fight leaders who, though even some of them were incompetent, like I can't remember the guy's name off the top of my head that led the Romans in the battle of like Lake Lake Tresemane uh, mm. prior to Cannae. They just like basically, they just like walked. They didn't have any patrols out. They had no formation. They just were like bebop in their way up against a lake with a <laughs> hill. Skilly bebop, beep, beep. <laughs> exactly. And they had no idea. That the Romans or that the Carthaginians were about to slaughter them. They did. Yeah. So they didn't have like competent leaders. They just had a strong country and a will to fight. The French just yeah. didn't. Yeah. No, you're exactly right. And that was like, that was the identity of Rome, right? It's like, we are Romans. Like, you may beat us, but you will not win. Like, we can lose a battle, but we will come back until that identity kind of faded. And yep. the idea of what Rome was, was no longer this indomitable, indomitable I can't say the word. Indomitable. Right now. Thank you. Will. <laughs> like, and it just kind of, you know, these empires collapse, not with a bang, but with a whimper, right? Like that's been a consistent theme of everything that we've talked about. Yeah. Oh, I was thinking of the head coach of the Detroit Lions. What's that? I forget Dan his Campbell. name. Dan Campbell. You know. He gave that press conference uh, early, may have been his first press conference. I forget what it was, but it was, you know, if it's on, it's on the real and short algorithms, but where he gave this press conference and he was like, you know, you're going to knock us down. They're going to like bite you on the way up. We're going to take a kneecap off. Like you can knock us down again. We're going to get right back up and we're going to fight you tooth and nail. We're going to fight, you know, viciously. And he was criticized, criticized It's like, he took a like, team that won one like one game, maybe two that season, to yeah. really like a play or two away from the Super Bowl in Detroit. And if you know anything yeah. about the Lions, in a very short garbage, time. garbage, always have yeah. been. Hopefully, they <laughs> always will be. But it's yeah. true. Like that attitude and that spirit does have something has an effect like that. Yeah, and I guess what to to final point it is like it's not mere rhetoric. Like, it's not just like a good soundbite. Like, it matters in moments of crisis. People need to know that their leader is going to continue to fight. And what that does is it makes you want to fight. It's like it has an effect of when the person in charge of your country, you know, uh, Churchill, like his, I think I read it. This is actually uh, his, his, fighting on the beaches speech when he goes on the radio is like you know everyone knows the part of the quote where he says like we'll fight you in the streets and we'll fight them on the beaches like there's a second part of that quote that doesn't get talked about where he says like and we'll and we'll fight you with broken beer bottles in our hands because that's bloody well all we got <laughs> and it's like that's churchill's attitude of like like you are not going to conquer britain like you can bomb london you can bomb uh you know all these all these different you know manchester industrial cities like you can take us out we are not going to give up done uh and it's just like you didn't see that in france france did not have that you just had this defeatism that was rife like a cancer in the entire country um okay um okay some last some last quotes here Briefly, as we close, I wanted to talk about from the Germans. What did the Germans think at this time? Like, what would have happened if France would have done something? And the most telling quote is from none other than Adolf Hitler himself. And Hitler said later, he said, quote, 
if the French had marched into the Rhineland, we would have had to withdraw with our tails between our legs, for the military resources at our disposal would have been wholly inadequate for even a moderate resistance. Later, other German generals would recall that March 7th was the only day that they ever saw Hitler scared. And Hitler's demeanor was one of just extreme anxiety and stress on March 7th, 1936, in a way that it was never, he was never that scared again. Even to the very end, when the Russians were approaching Berlin, he was not scared. He was angry. He was fired. Like he was trying to fight back. Like he was, he began like trying to control the defense of Berlin himself. Um, but like even Hitler was scared on March 7th, 1936, and the French did nothing. Um, one, one last quote that is just too, too good to pass up um, in, especially in our podcast about connecting history to current events and you know improving political and historical literacy. This is sure. This is the author of The Collapse of the Third Republic. France emerged from the crisis weakened in other ways. It had feared to act without British approval, and henceforth it would do nothing without the prior consent of the government in London. It thus abandoned an independent foreign policy. This subordination to Britain might not have been so disastrous had there been resolute men with a knowledge of history, even contemporary history, at the helm in London. And I think that, like, you know, to close this episode is... Like that's, I think, in in a very real way, what we're trying to do here at the Loins of History is like we want resolute men and women who understand history to be armed to face the challenges ahead. Because we all know there are there's challenges now, and we've overcome challenges, and there will continue to be challenges in the future. Some, you know, probably worse. I don't know when, but worse than anything that we've ever faced. But we need resolute men and women who understand history so that we don't repeat these same mistakes that were repeated in 1936. And as we continue to talk about just the repeated mistakes after that. I'm going to quote a great historian here. Mm. A leader with no knowledge of its peoples or its country or the world's history is like is like a captain on a ship with no rudder. Mm. And that was yeah. that was Colin at the Lines of History that just made that up on the spot. <laughs> I love the Michael Scott. Michael Scott. Oh, it's, it's like Wayne Gretzky. Michael, Michael Scott. Scott. <laughs> that was my Michael Scott moment. Yeah, that was no, your Michael true. Scott moment. Yeah, if you don't have an understanding of history, you have a tougher time predicting the events of the future and making decisions in the present. Yeah, yeah, dude. We should totally change our mission statement to. The Loins of History is designed to create resolute men and women <laughs> with We're a knowledge of history. to world leaders right now. <laughs> that, that's who our target audience is. Um, well, every American speaks to world leaders when they vote. We've talked about that. Uh, like I know it doesn't feel that way sometimes, but it really does matter. So, okay. Jay, fantastic episode and you know a lot of thought-provoking conversation on having a spirit of resoluteness amongst a nation's people to stand to the trials of of current events that seem to be slipping out of control right now. So good for people to go back and look at history to try and um, build some of that resolute character and and solid decision making so that they can look toward the future and, and make the right decisions now. You know, if you like what we're doing at the Loins of History, please like and subscribe on YouTube. You know, we're also on Spotify, Apple. If you like, give us a five-star review and a comment on Spotify or Apple or a podcast addict. We'll be able to give you a shout out if you subscribe on YouTube. Uh, depending on how many subscribers you get, we'll try that week. We'll try and give you a shout out as well as a comment, especially if they're good and productive comments for uh, conversation. Jay and I are also on social media in some iteration of Loins of History. We do like getting feedback via DM or gmail things like that so we have gotten some some solid feedback and requests actually back from some listeners thank you and we'll talk to you next week